Good morning, everybody. It is indeed great to see you here on a beautiful Sabbath morning. I am so happy that you have chosen to worship with us in Sheridan that this is a very special day in which we have a baptism taking place in the Sheridan Church this this morning. I am so happy that Doug is, has decided to give his life to Christ and become a member of the church in Sheridan. And so, I ask that you keep all keep Doug in your prayers as he is taking this first step in the journey that will last the rest of his life. And I ask that you will continue to um, extend a hand of fellowship to him when you get a chance to be able to meet him. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Our dear, kind, gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we First, thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day and for the many blessings that you bestow upon each of us during the week. We also ask a blessing upon Doug this morning as he has become a member of a member of the church in Sheridan, but more importantly has given his life to you. And now as we open the scriptures and begin to study together, I ask that you will Send your Holy Spirit to give us wisdom and understanding, and that the words that I speak be your words and not mine. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn with me to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. You know, some of you have already had the scripture reading this morning, but there are those that do watch online that do not get the benefit of that, so I would like to uh, be able to do that for them because it'll play a role into what's coming. Sometimes I use uh, the scripture reading as a setup, as a backdrop for what's happening in the sermon. Other times, like last week and this week, it's incorporated into the sermon and will come back. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Or do not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in the newness of life. What a beautiful passage. And I should have kept the screen right there because I want to go directly to the next passage. I want you to just go up just a few verses here to verse number 1, Romans chapter 6, verse 1, where it says, What shall we say then? In the writings of Paul, Paul sometimes does some interesting things with his writings. In the writings of Paul, he often uses this statement to arrest our attention or bring us to attention or getting us to look back at where we were just at, what we have just read or studied. Which I'm taking this a little out of context because we haven't had a chance to go back, but we're going to review this as we go along. But Paul's also trying to link us or link this statement that he's just made to what's coming, bringing continuity to the passage. In Romans chapter chapters 1 through 4, we don't have to go look it up, in Romans chapters 1 through 4, Paul has plainly shown that all men no matter if they are Jews, and I shouldn't use the word men here. Probably the better word to use is humanity. Paul has shown that all humanity, Jew and Gentile alike, are sinners. As such, they are under condemnation and in need of righteousness. Paul has given proof that this need for righteousness cannot be met legalistically. And by the way, legalism is our default mechanism. We go there by nature. 
It's our tendency. It's built into us. You give a slave a list of things to do to be freed, and they will follow that list no matter what the cost. And they're certainly not going to love the one that gave them the list in the first place. Paul's argument is righteousness can by, cannot be met legalistically by the works of obedience. And we see in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, so just flip back a couple pages to Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Paul's argument is that righteousness cannot be met legalistically by works of obedience. Paul states, therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, that would be God's sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But after making such a statement, Paul wants us to understand that God has done everything necessary to supply humanity's need in the good news of the gospel. Let me repeat that one more time so we make sure that we just heard what I said. But after making such a statement as Paul just did in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, Paul wants us to understand that God has done everything necessary to supply humanity's need in the good news of the gospel. God often, God offers, let me put it that way, God offers everyone a free gift. The gift of his grace complete pardon and reconciliation through Christ's faithfulness to do as he promised. That promise was made in Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 through 15. It was Christ who came to show us the true picture of who the Father is, and by so doing has lived, died, was risen for the redemption and the restoration of humankind. Or maybe a better way of stating it is humanity. In our truest, in our trust in his sacrifice of Christ that assures us in salvation. It is our trust in the sacrifice of Christ that assures us of our salvation. Paul naturally asks a question. That question is in Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Paul's been painting a picture, this contrasting picture, that through one man's sin, lack of trust in God, all humanity is sub subject to judgment, but through another man's righteousness, the free gift of life has come to all humanity. In Romans chapter 5, verse 20, Paul makes the statement, Romans chapter 5, verse 20, Moreover the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, Grace abounded much more. Moreover, the law. Moreover, the law, this is a reference to the law, should naturally cause us to ask the question, what law? Or which law is being referred to here? Paul is directing the attention of the Romans back to the time of Moses. The occasion in which the law entered would be at Mount Sinai. God established his identity in the law's preamble and then spoke the law to the people as we see in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. In essence, what God is saying, I am entering into covenant with you. And I promise to model that law 
and I, that I am going to give you. I am going to show you how to keep it. I want it to write it upon your hearts. That is my intent. That is what I would like to do, but you're not ready for that. So I'll write it upon two tablets of stone. Through trust in me, when you look upon the law, you will see things that, that you could not know were there without looking into the law or looking at the law. When you look upon the mirror or the reflection of my character, then you will see the dirt that is upon your face, that streak or that blemish that you could not see without first looking upon the law. Many will try and try and try, but they will never succeed in removing that blemish themselves. But you see, God is saying, I can do that for you. I can remove that blemish. My righteousness will cover that dirt. In fact, I will remove it as though it never was. As former slaves, the children of Israel answered in the only way they knew how. The only way that they knew how. What you have told us to do, we will do it. Yet amazingly, after all this and this display of power by God, and this and God trying to impress upon them who he was, two weeks later they are dancing around the golden calf, claiming that the golden calf is the entity that brought them out of Egypt. I don't want to use the word God was faced with a dilemma, but God had to modify his plan. He's good at modifying his plan to meet our human condition. And sometimes we get that wrong. We think we've got to modify ourselves to mold and fit what God's going to do, but God's going to meet us exactly where we're at every time. So God modifies his plan. He says, I must illustrate it to them. I must illustrate who I am and what my purpose is. I must show them what I'm willing to do for them. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, God is speaking to Moses, you... And he's saying, Go tell the people, you shall be to me as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. You see, God is saying, My desire for you, Israel, is for you to do the same work as I gave to Adam and Eve, and that is to tend and to keep. I've instilled with you my image Therefore, I want you to do the same thing that I asked Adam and Eve to do. I want you to tend and keep. But God can see this isn't going to work. So after the golden calf story, and what an interesting and complicated little story that that golden calf story really truly is. After the golden calf story, God says, it's not going to work. He picks a tribe, the tribe of Levi, to become his kingly priests. And through their ministry, God chose to reveal himself to the people, to illustrate who God the Father is, what God the Father's character is like, and what God the Father is willing to do for all humanity. In Romans chapter 5, verse 20, Romans chapter 5, verse 20. You shall be, um, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. What a confusing statement. Confusing enough that I lost my place there for a second. So in Romans chapter 5, verse 20, when it says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. 
God set the entire sanctuary on display, the entire sanctuary system on display to show what he was doing, to be able to open up his government to us so that there would be absolutely no questions as to what God's purpose was. He wanted to reveal the truth about his character and that through trust in him, we become saved. It served as an illustration of what God was doing for us. It showed us his true character. How do you show them who you are? How do you get to know somebody? All those of us that have that are married, understand that you may, under, you may think you know the person, but you really don't know the person until you begin to live with them. Therefore, God says, in order for them to understand whom I am, I'm going to have to tabernacle with them. Therefore, he had Moses build a tabernacle so that he could be with them, walk amongst them, and I can model myself to them. The physical structure showed that the people were still not ready to have the law written upon their hearts. God also knew that the people would twist. They would take this beautiful illustration as God was trying to demonstrate to the world exactly who God was and that they would take it and they would twist it. You see, they twisted it by thinking that they themselves were doing God a favor and that salvation came through what they were doing for God. See, God, see, see what we're doing. We are bringing sheep and goats and oxen to honor you. But the reality is this abhorred God. Because God abhorred God because this attitude, this legalistic system was not what God wanted or ever intended. This system of twisting truth to elevate their own position is not what God wanted then and isn't what God wants from us today. The purpose of the system and the rituals was to reveal to us and them what God is doing for us. The sacrifices were to teach the gravity of sin and that sin brings death. So it wasn't about their doing, but what God was doing for them. For the entire system was to show it was through one man's death that all might live. Therefore, Paul asks, having understood all this, in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul answers that with a resounding, certainly not. Once we understand the true character of God and the nature of of his sacrifice for us as illustrated in the sanctuary and exemplified in the teachings and life and miracles of Christ. Our natural inclination should be our awe and respect for what he has done for us should cause us to want to follow Jesus to place our trust in him, to carry out his work of righteousness in us and throughout the world. Certainly, as we continue that verse, Romans chapter 6, verse 2, Certainly not, how shall we who died in sin 
baptism, live any longer in it. This was the same thing God was trying to teach the Israelites of old. When you see God's true character and what he's willing to do for you and I, how can we continue to go on sinning? How is it that we continue to twist things to suit our purpose? How is it that we do not place our trust in God after all that God has done for us? You see, look at what the God the Father has done and look at what God the Son has done for us. So Paul continues by asking more questions. Finally, in verse 3 of Romans chapter 6, he says, Or do you not know as many of us as were baptized into Jesus were baptized into his death? As believers in Christ, as believers in Christ, we place our trust in God and his faithfulness. In baptism, we publicly show our trust in God by our burial in the watery grave of baptism. We are saying that we accept Christ's sacrifice. We are giving to him all the impurity and filth that has filled our heart. As Christ touched the leper, as Christ touched the crippled, as Christ touched the blind, the mute, the deaf, and even as Christ touched the dead. He remained untainted. Nothing around him caused him to become impure, and he will remove all the impurity from our lives as well. Therefore, we are dying to self and are resurrected to other-centered love when we enter into that water and are lifted up. Therefore, as it says in verse verse 4 of Romans chapter 6, Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death, that that, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even though we should walk in newness. When he raised, when, when raised from the watery grave of baptism, we are awakening to and walking in the newness of life. All by way of Christ's righteousness and because of our trust in Christ. Verse 5 states, For if we have been united in the likeness of his death, certainly we we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Verse 6, knowing that for our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we no longer be slaves of sin. Then our last verse, for he who has died has freed us from sin. The passage is trying to get us to see that the old us, the old man of sin that we are, passes away and dies and should not return when we enter into that water and are brought forth a new person in newness of life. When we die to self, when we are freed from sin, All this is made possible, but both Jesus and Paul let us know that this isn't easy. They both let us know that it is tough, especially when friends and relatives suddenly turn against us. My dad became a Seventh-day Adventist in 1943 during the height of World War II. My dad and his brothers, there was eight siblings in all, including himself. All eight siblings were very, very close. It was a really close-knit family. 
And my dad said upon accepting this Seventh-day Adventist message, upon being a Christian, not that they weren't Christians, he goes, but becoming a true Christian, a true follower of Christ, he goes, the relationship I had with my siblings was never the same. Paul even went so far to say, what I want to do, I cannot do, and what I don't want to do, I do. And he admonishes us, because of this, we must give up of self daily. For the Old Testament people, their trust in God, they're looking forward to the event of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection is counted to them as righteousness. When Abraham was asked to go sacrifice Isaac, Abraham fully trusted in God that God knew exactly what he was doing, even to the point that if Isaac's life had been taken, he was convinced that God would do something again for him and bring him another son. Therefore, Abraham's trust in God and his being able to see what God was trying to do was counted to him as righteousness. For us today, for those who are baptized, this is a perfect opportunity to recommit yourself to God. To look at Christ and look at God and look and see what they have done for you and rededicate your life to Him. For those that have just been baptized, we pray and will will strive with you in order for you to establish a relationship with God. And for those that are looking to be baptized, when we trust in God and see what God has modeled for us and done, what he has promised that he will do that he has done, then it is counted as to righteousness for us. And our last slide slide says, For he who has died has been freed from sin. Christ is asking that daily we die to self and that we give our heart to him so that he can write his law in our heart. He wants us to be kingly priests. He wants us to to work and keep as he asked Adam and Eve and the Israelites to do. And it is when we keep our eyes focused upon Jesus and what Jesus has done for us, trusting in Jesus, then it is counted as righteousness to us. This is what Jesus is and God's desire is for us to impart their righteousness to us when we trust fully in him. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Our dear, kind, gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to have taken a look at this story of this illustration that Paul has put together for us to help us understand the relationship between legalism and trust and God's desire for us to trust in him so that he can impart his righteousness to us. And that through baptism, we, like Christ, are buried and resurrected in the newness of life. May we ever remain focused upon you. May you instill upon us the trust and the courage that we need to carry forward 
We ask this in your son's holy and precious name. Amen.